June 907, the plans outside Dorylium. 25,000 Turkish horse archers form up in their traditional crescent, ready to execute the Tulugma, the envelopment that's conquered half of Asia. They've crushed Byzantine armies, shattered Persian kingdoms, and today they're about to erase a rabble of European religious fanatics who think God will save them. Then something appears on the horizon that makes every single one of them question reality itself. Seventy tons of composite armor, a gas turbine screaming like a demon, and a 120mm smoothbore cannon that can delete a castle from two miles away. An M1A2 Abrams main battle tank, dropped into the First Crusade. No resupply, no backup, no GPS satellites, just one crew, one machine, and about to rewrite medieval warfare in the most violent way possible. The Turks charge, standard tactics, proven over decades. Stay mobile, fire from 600 meters, bleed the enemy with 10,000 arrows. The Abrams responds with its coaxial machine gun, 7.62 millimeter rounds at 750 per minute. In the first 30 seconds, 20 riders drop. Horses panic from the sound alone, a mechanical roar they've never heard, louder than any creature on earth. The next two minutes, sustained fire cuts down a hundred more. The formation shatters. Survivors retreat in total confusion, screaming into the wind about metal fortresses that hunt cavalry. The tank commander switches to canister rounds. Each shell contains 1,100 tungsten balls traveling at 1,400 meters per second. Eight shots into the charging formations, 800 to 1,000 Turks simply cease to exist. The battle that historically lasted eight hours ends in 30 minutes. Turkish commander Kilij Arslan watches his army evaporate and realizes he's fighting something that breaks every rule of war he knows. But here's the problem. That Abrams is running on borrowed time. The gas turbine drinks fuel like a fraternity pledge at spring break. Ten gallons per hour just idling, 60 gallons per hour cross-country, 80-plus in combat. The tank carries 500 gallons internally, which sounds like plenty until you do the math. Four to five hours of realistic combat operations, maybe 100 miles of movement before it becomes the world's most expensive lawn ornament. And this is 1096. There's no JP-8 jet fuel. Crusaders try olive oil, animal fat, even whale lamp oil. The fuel injectors clog in minutes. The engine seizes. Medieval blacksmiths stare at turbine blades like they're alien artifacts, which functionally they are. The tank gets one operational window, three to five weeks maximum before sand infiltration, hydraulic seal degradation, and track pin failures turn it into a static pillbox. The Turks adapt fast. Week two, their scouts notice patterns. The tank stops moving at night. It stays with the slow Crusader infantry column. It avoids narrow mountain passes because it's 12 feet wide and most medieval roads are eight. So they set a trap lure the crusaders into a canyon 11 feet across, just tight enough. The tank advances confidently because it's been unstoppable so far. Turkish cavalry retreats, classic feigned flight. The tank pursues 400 meters into the pass. Then 50 men on the ridges above lever boulders down with iron bars. Blocks both exits. The tank's trapped in an 11-foot stone corridor. Now the Turks on the 300-foot cliffs above start dropping more boulders onto the engine deck, where armor is 2 inches instead of 20. They pour burning oil onto the rear air intakes. Thermal vision becomes useless in the smoke. The crew has three options. Stay buttoned up and die from heat stroke in six hours when internal temperature hits 140. Abandon the vehicle and get cut down by archers or call for infantry support that arrives in four hours to find the tanks a permanent mobility kill and the Turks have vanished. They just neutralized a 70-ton war machine without losing a single soldier in direct combat. Meanwhile in Jerusalem, Fatimid intelligence networks have been tracking this iron gin since Antioch. They know it's coming. They know walls fall before it like sandcastles, so they prepare. They deliberately weaken the northern wall, control exactly where the breach will occur. Behind that weak section, they dig a pit, 15 feet deep, 30 feet wide, covered with timber and dirt. The crusaders arrive. The tank fires heat rounds at the obvious weak point, breaches the wall as expected, advances through. The ground collapses. 70 tons drops 15 feet onto stone. Track thrown. Crew concussed. Gun barrel bent three degrees. Belly armor cracked. Nightfall, Fatimid sappers crawl to the pit edge and pour Greek fire down.
Ancient napalm rises on convection, chokes the engine intakes, forces a shutdown. The miracle weapon sits powerless. Crusaders spend two days trying to extract it with oxen, but medieval winches max out at ten tons and this beast weighs seventy. The tank's permanently immobilized. The crew abandons it, joins the infantry, and the siege reverts to traditional medieval slaughter. Jerusalem still falls after five weeks of horrific casualties. The tank killed maybe 600 defenders total before it died. History barely shifts. Back in the Crusader camp, the politics are already toxic. Bohemond wants the tank for his Normans. Raymond claims it as senior leader. Godfrey insists it should protect pilgrims. They agree to rotate support, which means the tank's never where it's tactically needed, always where it's politically convenient. After Antioch falls in two days instead of eight months thanks to wall breaching, Bohemond tries to drug the crew at a victory feast so his engineers can study the machine. The crew, trained in modern survival tactics, detects the plot, seals the hatches and threatens to fire on Bohemond's troops. The standoff ends, but trusts dead. Then there's Byzantium. Emperor Alexio sees this weapon and knows it could restore the Roman Empire. He offers unlimited gold, supplies, promises of worship. The crew refuses. So Alexio sends 200 cataphracts to ambush them in a mountain pass, planning to kill the crew and seize the prize. Canister rounds massacre the first charge. 30 armored horsemen deleted instantly. But the crew realizes they're outnumbered and faces the ultimate decision. Let Byzantines capture future technology intact or drop a thermite grenade in the engine compartment. Modern doctrine is clear. Deny critical assets to adversaries. The tank destroys itself. Alexios gets nothing. The crusade loses its superweapon. 42 main gun rounds fired across the entire campaign. 21 at major battles, 21 held in reserve. 6,000 machine gun rounds expended. Approximately 2,500 enemy killed by the tank directly. Historical First Crusade saw 100,000 Muslim military casualties, with the tank, 97,000. The civilian massacre at Jerusalem's fall, 40,000 dead, happens exactly the same because human cruelty doesn't need technology to flourish. The tank operational for maybe four weeks out of a three-year campaign. That's 3% of the timeline. Tactical terror weapon, not a strategic game changer. Jerusalem falls two months earlier, the Crusader kingdoms established are just as fragile. Muslims reconquer everything by 1187, same as history. The tank becomes legend. Stories grow with each retelling until it's a hundred feet tall, flies through the air, and breathes dragon fire. Islamic scholars spent two centuries trying to replicate it, accidentally accelerating gunpowder development by a hundred years, maybe discovering steam power in pursuit of engines without horses, potentially triggering an early renaissance, or just as likely causing a technological dark age when everyone concludes God's weapons can't be understood by man and science gets suppressed for 400 years. So what actually happens when you drop the most advanced tank on Earth into the First Crusade? You get six weeks of absolute domination, followed by three years of the same medieval brutality. The tank wins battles, doesn't win the war, can't change human nature. When the thunder fades and the Iron Beast falls silent, you're left with victory arriving three months early and a graveyard that looks exactly the same. Think the Crusaders could have done better with three tanks? Six? Or would more just mean more spectacular failures? Drop your tactical analysis in the comments. Subscribe for more historical what-ifs that probably shouldn't exist but definitely needed to be simulated. Thanks for watching.